again, thank you for joining us. And uh, wow, all the way from South Africa, St. Martin, Saipan, and Dallas, Texas. Again, thank you for, for tuning in. And um, before we begin, um, I'd like to have a word of prayer. Kind Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day you've given us. We ask, Lord, that you please fill us with your Holy Spirit. We praise you and thank you for your mercy and grace that although we're in different parts of the world, you allowed us to come close together, Lord, um, because of technology. Lord, I pray that uh, may you be lifted up in this meeting. Help us draw closer to you and help us, Lord, the time that we're living in, Father God, and help us to prepare. You've given us everything. So I pray, Lord, that um, as we begin, please impress our hearts and minds, Lord, to get rid of any sins in our life that's hindering us to have a closer walk with thee so we can share the good news to those around us. In all this, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So for those that are new here, um, we have two topics, a spiritual topic and a practical topic. The first one will be covered by Brother Don. He is a university professor and has been blessing us with a lot of um, topics that will help us in our country living journey. And the next one will be uh, Brother Jim, an engineer, who is sharing his testimony of his experience moving to the country and the challenges of, of finding mold in his country home. And, and tonight it's gonna be how to test your home uh, for mold. And of course, we will have a question and answer session. So for those on Facebook and YouTube, please post your questions on the chat section. And on Zoom, please send it to me privately, and we will go over that. So again, if you haven't joined us, um, meet, uh, join us on Slack, where you can virtually connect with one another. And Slack is a place where you will not be canceled um, in comparison to Facebook. And so our topic for tonight, uh, it will be led by Brother Don for uh, for the first uh, for the title. Is it a lack of faith to be a Christian prepper? Okay, so Brother Don, please join us. Uh, that's a pretty scary picture there. <laughs> <laughs> the guy with the gas mask, love it. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll share my screen. There we go. I don't think I have any sound, but I will share it. Okay. Okay, thank you for those testimonies. Wow, God is good. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, thank you. Well, um, so is it a lack of faith to be a Christian prepper is the topic. And before we start, I wanted to thank Andrew, Brother Andrew, for uh, his uh, testimony today. Um, if you didn't recognize that voice, that's the Andrew who has been helping me in the previous sessions when we were doing uh, gardening kinds of related topics. Um, and he has been contributing to our website, preparingforthetimeoftrouble.com, with um, over, I would say, over 70 different wild edible plant uh, introductions. Uh, so if you go to preparingforthetimeoftrouble.com and click on uh, Homestead Remedies, uh, Andrew will be able to educate you on all kinds of plants and uh, he does such a good job. Appreciate his contributions very much. Okay, let's uh, start with the Bible. Ezekiel 38, 7 says, Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Let's pray before we start. Father in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you for 
the opportunity that this technology is affording for like believers from all over the world in different time zones to get together and share and encourage each other and learn. I pray that our all of our presentations tonight will be an encouragement and uh, be instruments used of you to uh, give us the tools to be able to follow the instruction you've given us to move into the country from the cities. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So is it a lack of faith to be a Christian prepper? By the way, if you don't know what a prepper is, it's someone who is pretty much consumed with the idea of being prepared for catastrophes. There have been TV shows and uh, lots of websites on the internet and YouTube videos about prepping. And uh, generally these people are not from a Christian perspective. Uh, they are uh, survivalists. I believe that they are, that the, the difference is that they believe in um, uh, evolution and they don't uh, necessarily believe in a God. And so if you believe in evolution, then your perspective is the survival of the fittest. So many times uh, these preppers are survivalists to the point that they would store up food and, and you know, have hideouts and what have you. And their, their, their mindset is when, when things get bad and I've prepared and somebody hasn't and they come on my property, maybe in, even in a threatening way, or, or not a threatening way. You know, my family's hungry, can you share? Their perspective is we're not sharing because we won't have enough for us. And I have a gun to prove it. And if you try to take my stuff, I'll kill you. Unfortunately, that is the mindset that a person has when they don't have God and his promises. And so the difference between a doomsday prepper, most of them, and a Christian prepper would be that the Christian prepper may be preparing, but not doing it in a selfish way. So anyway, just so you understand that uh, at the outset. So Matthew 6, 31 says, therefore take no thought saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed for your father knoweth what you need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. This text is often used by um, Christians who think that it's, it's uh, not a Christian thing to be a prepper. And you can see why, because this is clearly saying, don't worry about what are you going to eat and drink and clothing and all that. God will take care of you. But we know that we need to look at the whole Bible and, and find the balance. So the question is, is this text about not needing to work or prepare food to eat? Or is it about not worrying about the future? Does it mean you shouldn't? buy clothes? Does it mean you shouldn't go grocery shopping and prepare food or, or something to drink? And so I think it's fairly obvious when you look at that question that it could be that this verse is saying, don't worry. Take no thought. Don't worry. Here's another text, James 5, 1 to 3. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come unto you. Your riches are corrupt, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were with fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. So is this verse saying that um, that we shouldn't have garments and gold and and possessions. Is this about a Christ-like prepper or is it about a self-centered rich man in the end times? You'll notice it's talking about the last days. So 
uh, I think you'll find as we proceed that in order for this text to balance with the other verses in the Bible, that this is talking about selfishness. It's not necessarily saying you shouldn't buy clothes and you shouldn't, you know, have have possessions. Early writings, page 56 and 57, the Lord has shown me repeatedly that it's contrary to the Bible to make any provision for our temporal wants in the time of trouble. This reference is used most frequently, uh, especially, you know, Seventh-day Adventist people that, that, that don't feel that our uh, focus on physical preparation is appropriate. They feel that it's a lack of faith. So here, let's read this and understand where they're coming from. The Lord has shown me repeatedly that it's contrary to the Bible to make any provision for our temporal wants in the time of trouble. I saw that if the saints had food laid up by them or in the field in the time of trouble when sword, famine, and pestilence are in the land, it would be taken from them by violent hands and strangers would reap their fields. Then will be the time for us to trust wholly in God. He was I saw that our bread and water will be sure at that time, and that we shall not lack or suffer hunger. <clears throat> for God is able to spread a table for us in the wilderness. If necessary, he will send ravens to feed us, as he did with the feeding Elijah, and rain or rain manna from heaven like he did the Israelites. So clearly, this is talking about the time of trouble, the end of the world. This is talking about that it's contrary to the Bible to make any provisions for your temporal wants. So you can see how this, this quote could be used to say, we shouldn't even have this, uh, this Zoom uh, platform promoting, you know, getting out of the cities and, and preparing for, you know, the times to come because the Bible says clearly, no temporal wants in the time of trouble. So here again, we need to look at the whole body of, of evidence and find the balance. Because if you just take one quote and hang your beliefs on one quote, you can be wrong because there may be 10 other quotes that, that say the opposite and, and you need to find balance. Those of you who were here last week, um, we talked about um, the um, sign to leave the cities. And um, that had a had a problem. Uh, if someone could admit our waiting person, thank you. Um, we we showed last week that there was. If you read Country Living, it would appear that there are uh, discrepancies between. Uh, in the future, we're going to move out of the city. Now's the time to leave the city. You should have left the city a long time ago, kind of quotes. And when we studied it all in, in together, we understood why there were differences and it wasn't contradictory. A person could read that without going deeper into it and say, well, you can't believe what Ellen White says, she contradicts herself. Well, no, she doesn't. So here's another example right here that if you took this by itself, you might not have the full picture. Um, so we talked about uh, in a previous session, and it's now on the uh, Adventist Country Living Journey YouTube channel, as well as preparingforthetimeoftrouble.com, part 185. We talked about there are three times of trouble. And this is the chart that we developed in that session. And um, I had thought up until recently there were two times of trouble. There was the little time of trouble with the mark of the beast, and there was Jacob's time of trouble when you flee to the mountains. But uh, we discovered by looking more closely at Great Controversy sequence that there's actually three of them. And we learned in that session that even James White made a, a time chart similar to this with different names, uh, th that there were three times of trouble. So this concept of three times of trouble isn't uh, unique to this discussion. So the point is for this uh, topic is that there, there's a big difference between the little time of trouble and the times of trouble after the close of probation. 
a little time of trouble is when you can't buy or sell. There's the mark of the beast. And, and so that's when you should be able to sustain yourself. That's why Ellen White said to move out of the cities into the country so that you can grow a garden because the problem of buying and selling, little time of trouble, will be a very serious one. So it, here you can see that there's a difference between the little time of trouble when you're when you're still functioning but you can't buy or sell and the other times of trouble when you're fleeing to the mountains and there's the plagues falling and all of that when at, at that point god's gonna take care of you and your bread and water will be sure so here is the quote that i just uh, uh, referenced again and again the lord has instructed our people to take their families away from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions for the in the future the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one we should now begin to heed the instruction given us over and over again so notice again the significance is the reason we leave the cities mentioned in this reference is so that you can raise your own food and the reason you need to raise your own food is you're not going to be able to go to walmart and buy your food pretty logical so here is an example of preparing granted it's not doomsday press prepping with a gas mask but it is preparing for physical needs during this uh little time of trouble as compared to after probation closes there will be no we very likely by then won't even ha have our homes we'll be fleeing to the mountains and god will have to provide because we won't have the gardens Jerry Franklin was a gentleman uh, from British Columbia who was uh, a proponent of this uh, kind of thing of being prepared. And, and he has since passed away and his family is attempting to continue the ministry. Um, they would put on week long uh, training camps, very similar to um, what several uh, people in this group here and this platform have been doing. Uh, until COVID made it hard to physically get together. Thus, we have the virtual camp meeting. But Jerry Franklin, um, they, they would, he would travel around and do seminars in churches. And then in the summer, uh, at no cost, by the way, like, like those of you that have done this, um, he'd put on this camp meeting training of how to be self-sustaining. And um, when when I heard him was very early on to my uh, learning about moving out of the cities and, and all of this and doing my research from whence have come my seminars. And what caught my uh, caught me by surprise is he was he was doing his seminar in Phoenix, Arizona, the downtown Phoenix church. And uh, at the end, there was a question and answer session. And so somebody said, OK, so. Now you've moved out in the country and you've got this garden. And now, think back to the doomsday prepper kind of my mentality. Now some people come on your property and say, hey, I see you have a garden and we're hungry. Can we have some food? And I thought, you know, I never thought about that at that point. I hadn't, I really hadn't. I'd been thinking about how would we sustain our, our family. I haven't. I had thought about what would be my answer if someone came on and said, I need help. It might be different if they're back in a, you know, AR-15 and forcing you. But uh, for this example, it's somebody in need that's wanting to have you help. And, and I thought, well, what if I only have enough food for in the garden for us? And his answer is really, really so obvious as it is, it just really hit me. He said, of course, I'm going to share because God will provide. And, you know, it, it, it really hit home to me because look at Elijah. You know, Elijah went to the widow. She had enough food and oil for one more meal for, for her and her son. But Elijah asked her to share. And if she had said no, they would have died. But because she stepped out in faith and shared what she had, which if you think about it, she had enough for two 
and she shared it with a third. So just the fact that it made enough for three was a miracle, but they lived for, you know, three and a half years off of that little bit. And so I have, since that seminar with Jerry Franklin, I have firmly believed that when the time comes that we've got our gardens in the country and someone comes to ask for help, we should, we should be ready and willing to share and God will bless. And if somebody comes and steals your stuff out of your garden, uh, I bet you'll wake up in the morning, it'll grow back miraculously. Now, obviously, this doesn't apply to after probation because we've already read that enemies will come and et cetera. We're going to be fleeing. We're not going to stick around, but we're talking about when you can't buy or sell. So God bless Jerry Franklin for opening my eyes back in the day. Selective Messages, Book 2, page 142. The work of the people of God is to prepare for the events of the future, which will soon come, come upon them with blinding force. Obviously, we need to prepare spiritually, but we are also are to prepare physically. And this stuff's going to happen so fast. It's going to come upon us with blinding force. Wow, those are pretty pretty bold words. So, um, and she even uses the word prepare, which is interesting. We don't have to guess what she was meaning. Um, so where does faith and presumption, where does faith end and presumption begin? If, if our bread and water will be sure, and God will um, do like he did for the widow with Elijah, why do we even need to bother? I mean, you know, don't we don't need to put out lots of effort, just do a little bit, then God will fill in the rest. Well, uh, some Christians will say that we don't need to do anything, any preparing for the times ahead, because God will provide and our bread and water are sure. Are sure. The book Education, page 217 says, let them read of Jesus the carpenter, Paul the tent maker, just a minute, I mean, need to move a window so I can read it. Who, with the toil of the craftsman, linked the highest ministry, human and divine. So these two people, Jesus was a carpenter, Paul was a tent maker. They were, they were uh, doing physical work, and they were blending it into ministry. Let them read the, of the lad whose five loaves were used by the Savior, in that wonderful miracle of the feeding of the multitude, of Dorcas the seamstress, called back from death, that she might continue to make garments for the poor, or the wise woman described in the Proverbs, who seeketh wool and flax, and worketh willingly with her hands, who giveth meat to her household, and their task to her maidens, who planteth a vineyard, and strengthened her arms, and stretched out her hand to the poor, yea, reached forth her hand to the needy, who looked well the ways of her household, and eaten not the bread of idleness. So, the miracle of the 5,000, the, of all of those people, the only one that we know that had anything was the little boy. And the lad with five loaves and two fishes came to the gathering prepared because his mother planned ahead, unlike the others. Joshua 10, God told Joshua and the Israelites they would be victorious. This one's really significant. Watch this. So Joshua had been told that they were going to win this battle. But did they relax and do nothing? No, they marched all night long and battled. And then God rewarded them by making the sun stand still. Wow. Couldn't, he, couldn't Joshua have said, hey, guys, let's, uh, let's just sit by the fire because we're going to win this battle tomorrow. God promised it. No, they, they did everything they possibly could. This, is, this explains it in detail. Patriarchs and Prophets 509. Joshua had received the promise of God, which surely overthrow the enemies of Israel. 
yet he put forth an as earnest an effort as though success depended upon the armies of Israel alone. Let that sink in. He did all that human energy could do, and then cried in faith for divine aid. The secret of success is the union of divine power with human effort. Those who achieve the greatest results are those who rely most implicitly upon the almighty arm. <clears throat> Christian Education 179, the life of Christ points out our duty to be diligent in labor and provide for those entrusted to our care. <clears throat> Desire of Ages 535, what human power can do, divine power is not summoned to do. God does not dispense with man's aid. He strengthens him, cooperating with him as he uses the powers and capabilities given him. James 2, what is a prophet, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Even so faith, if it has no works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. My favorite uh, part of Great Controversy is the last four chapters or so, and that goes into great detail about the little time of trouble and the great time of trouble, and it's worth reading frequently. But preppers today, for many preppers, disaster, natural or otherwise, natural would be uh, earthquakes and fires, and the other could be a nuclear bomb, is just around the corner, they believe. And being prepared for these emergencies isn't just good advice, it's a way of life. Self-reliance is an intrinsic value to the community, and many are skeptical that the government will provide, will not provide any meaningful help. Mark 13, seven through nine. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. places There will be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows, but take heed to yourselves. Second Peter 3.10. Since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. We need to prepare spiritually, for sure. Matthew 24. Uh, pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither the Sabbath day, for then shall be a great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days be shortened, there'll be no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, these days will be shortened. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known that the watch of the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered that the house be broken up. Therefore, be ye ready. Check my microphone, make sure you can hear me. We've got a siren down on the highway, and I'm sure we're going to have coyotes yelp in here pretty quick. Oh, you can hear you. <laughs> Matthew 25. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps, went forth to meet the bridegrooms. Five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So this parable is about the end time. And of course, the oil represents the Holy Spirit, but is it possible the principle here is to be prepared? Prophets and Kings 2.63, when God opens the way um, to do certain work, he gives assurance of success. The chosen instrumentality must do all in his power to bring about the promised result. In proportion to the enthusiasm and perseverance with which the work is carried forward will be the success given. God can work miracles for his people only as they act their part with untiring energy. 
about spiritual preparation? Last day events 220. We need to be settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so we can not be moved. This is really important because when it gets down to, um, you know, not being able to buy or sell or feed your family or even threatening of imprisonment or death, are you going to be settled into the truth so so tightly that you can't be moved? It's one thing to believe the truth intellectually, but spiritually it's it's in your heart and you wholeheartedly believe it and would never waver from it. So that's very important. Settling into the truth both intellectually and spiritually so you can't be moved. Testimonies of the Church, Volume 5. Experimental. I love that word. Experimental. It means you're, you're I, I see it meaning two things. Experimental religion is experiencing it, but it's also, God says, prove me, test me. So uh, experimental religion is what is needed now. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Some say, some, yes, a large number, have a theoretical knowledge of religious truth, but they've never felt the renewing power of divine grace upon their own hearts. These persons are ever slow to heed the testimonies of warning, reproof, and instruction guided by the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Last day events 149, if we are called to suffer, oh man, this is powerful. If we are called to suffer for Christ's sake, we shall be able to go to prison, trusting in the Lord as a little child trusts his parents. Now is the time to cultivate faith in God. So, faith check. Do you think that you are currently at a spiritual level where you would suffer for Christ's sake and trust him just like a little child trusts his parents. See the picture of the little boy jumping off? He knows dad's going to catch him. But then what about physical preparation? By the way, this, this is a cover of a Sabbath School Quarterly preparing for the end times. <clears throat> uh, God told Joseph, to have Pharaoh prepare for hard times ahead. Is it possible that God would warn us like he did Joseph and Pharaoh about hard times to come and the value of making preparations? Potential coming difficult times that preppers and we would be uh, expecting to see are collapse of the dollar, the grid goes down for an extended period of time, tornadoes, hurricanes, nuclear war, EMP, that's a, a nuclear bomb set off uh, above the atmosphere and um, say 100 miles up. And, and that would, uh, that silent wave of, of electronic charge would, would wipe out potentially all microelectronics. And so that would take the grid down and make your car quit if you had a newer car and so forth. Earthquakes, tsunamis, and flooding. How cool we have thunder. We don't get thunder very often. Proverbs 6, our son said this week he had thunder so loud that it shook the windows and felt like an earthquake. <clears throat> Proverbs 6, give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to their eyelids. Deliver thyself as in a gazelle. A gazelle is a really fast deer from the hand of the hunter. So it's saying, uh, don't sleep, don't slumber, and uh, be ready to run like a, like a gazelle would if somebody was hunting him, or as a bird in the hand of the fowler. Go to the ant, a sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which have no guide, overseer or ruler. Provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of your sleep? Even ants and bees and squirrels prepare for the winter. Select Messages Book 2. The work of the people of God is to prepare for the events of the future. will soon come upon them in blinding force. So we need to pray for guidance. Um, we don't want to... Uh, 
make moves that are foolish, um, need to move as God uh, uh, gives you opportunity uh, and you can afford to do. I think the counsel is we, we should have our eye on the goal and take baby steps as God gives us the opportunity to, to make preparations. Pray for guidance, then, then move forward. 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God hath not given us a spirit, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So we don't need to be fearful. This, this whole idea of following the council, moving out of the cities, trying to be learn how to garden, how to be more sustainable, it can seem very overwhelming and seem impossible. But we don't have to have the spirit of fear. God will help us and he will give us a sound mind to make smart decisions and he will bless our efforts. And that is the end of my presentation. Amen. Thanks so much, Brother Don. You're welcome. And um, also, I just wanted to say that um, as we're doing this um, virtual country living um, camp meeting, um, the next topic that will be brought by uh, Brother Don is um, is prophetic. Brother Don, would you like to share more as um, for next next weeks and the coming weeks to come? Brother Don, you're mute. Sorry. <laughs> uh, every time I've done these seminars at churches, someone will ask, when do you think this is going to happen and how long is it going to be? Mm -hmm. Well, no man knows the day or the hour of Jesus' return is the simple answer. But um, next week's study will be Matthew 24 and attempting to answer the question, um, when will the time of trouble be? And then following that, there's going to be a series trying to address the question of how, how long will the time of trouble be? And I believe that the answer to the first question is in Matthew 24, and the answer to the second question of how long is in Daniel 12. Mm -hmm. And that's not a study that can be done in one session. It's actually going to be a number in a row. And it's very important, if you're interested in that, to try to take them all in so that by the time we get to the answer to the question, you've had all the potential questions about it covered. I'm excited to share that with you. Yeah. So are we. Thank you so much, Brother Don, for another awesome um, message. And um, now is uh, we are going to call on Brother Jim. Brother Jim is going to talk about the our second topic, a more uh, practical topic regarding um, what if you find mold or how how can you test if mold is in your country home? Because I know that was one of the main concerns that we had when we bought our country property was how do we know if, if our cabin had mold because it's been abandoned for 10 years? So um, Brother Jim, go ahead. Good evening, Sharon. Good to see everybody. Good evening, Brother Don. And uh, it's good to be uh, back on, talk about mold and our experiences that, that we had and uh, and how uh, you could be able to benefit from, from knowing some of the things that we didn't know and, and found out about. And so uh, I'm going to bring up my, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, I have a PowerPoint I want to want to share with you. Bring it up here. And so last week we uh, we talked about mold in your health and uh, talked about the impact it can have because my wife got got very sick and we're going to talk to uh, I'll give a little introduction and then talk about home testing and and inspection and how how you could uh, find out if mold is going to be a problem or not for you and your not only your country home but any any really any home. And so this is my family um, back in. Uh, uh, seven years ago, uh, we moved out of the suburbs to our country home. This is our, one of our first, uh, probably our first Thanksgiving, I think, in, in the home when we uh, 
we uh, moved out of the country and it was uh, me and my wife uh, going going clockwise from the from the left jennifer uh, my my daughter who lives with uh, my wife uh claudia on the on the left and that's me of course at the head of the table and i have my uh, my son on the on the right and his and his wife rebecca and they live in an apartment that we built connected to to the house and so we finally uh, found this uh, little home. This is the front of it. It's just only a two bedroom, two bath home. Um, uh, it's a two story home. And this is the back of it. And uh, in order to make it uh, where we all live there together, we, we took the carport that was on the left hand side and we uh, we add this uh, this addition to it and, uh, and built uh, another bedroom upstairs with the master bedroom, master bath. And then uh, the bottom was a, uh, was about an 800 square foot apartment for my uh, for my son and my my daughter in law, and so we've been all living together uh, here in this uh, in this property here. Practically just doubled the house. Yeah, it's on 23 acres up in uh, north uh, northwest Georgia, and uh, we just absolutely love it. It's a dream come true for us to uh, to move out to the country and and just uh, experience nature and uh, and be able to plant and. Uh, and we um, we just have a wonderful life. I uh, fortunately, God blessed me where I could work from home. But after we built the addition, um, my wife uh, started becoming uh, sicker and sicker, losing uh, losing body weight and uh, not be able to eat anything. Uh, terrible uh, indigestion and bloating with her uh, with food, and um, didn't know why. Didn't know what was going on. And uh, she tried uh, a lot of different, doing lots and lots of research. And then uh, finally, we worked with, um, we uh, came across on the internet, uh, a, a natural, uh, they call them, um, uh, what, uh, Sharon, you, you call, had a name for them, the people who are, who are doc, functional medicine. That's what she said, right? Functional medicine. That's right. Thank you. I remember last week, right? Functional medicine doctor, Dr. Wes uh, uh, Youngberg, uh, an Adventist. Um, and worked with him on the phone through um, through a video conferencing, and um, and found and really uh, determined that our problem was mold in the house, and that she was getting sick from it, and, and basically she needed to get out as soon as possible. And and we all had a number of different health health issues, varying degrees, and so we uh, ended up um, buying a trailer and putting it in the. And we, my wife and I. Uh, lived in this trailer for two years while we, uh, we sorted out the, the issues with our with our house. And so uh, we're finally uh, after two years, we're just back in just for about a, a year now. And um, we're going to go through the, the rehab, uh, how we how we went through the rehabilitation or the remediation, they call it, of the house with with the with the mold in it and how and how that uh, that all came to be. And uh, uh, just a brief uh, introduction. What, what happened was, is that we had stored all our all our books and all our furniture and a lot of it in my mother's house in her basement. And uh, my mother uh, started having dementia and with Alzheimer's and didn't turn on the air conditioner or the heat in order to save money. And all our stuff in her basement got got moldy. And we didn't think anything of it. You know, what's a little bit of mold, right? You don't want to hurt anybody. Right? But we were dead wrong. We were dead because mold is very, uh, very serious. And um, and so we uh Put it, loaded everything in our cars, brought it here. So we contaminated our cars, contaminated our house. And then there was a problem with, uh, uh, with a leaky, leaking underneath our dishwasher. And uh, with um, a, a hot air vent was, blow, was drying the, uh, the air and blowing a mold through, through the house. And so mold exposure uh, can cause um, allergies. That, that, that's probably the least, you know, upper respiratory infections, which my, uh, my, my daughter-in-law was uh, was uh, getting quite a bit flu-like symptoms, sleep disorders, itching throat, eyes, and skin, chronic aches and pains. This is uh, something that I, I would get inflammation in my muscles, uh, headaches. My dust of my daughter experienced asthma. None of us had that. Memory loss. So this is what my mother actually had, and it got worse and worse. And uh, we were told that you got to get her out of there, or else um, uh, she's going to have some serious uh, mental pro issues. And and she did, unfortunately. Um, uh, she is now in, um, in, a, in a nursing home. She just, uh, after not wanting to live with us because she didn't want to live in the country, but we, we tried but uh, and, and tried to help her recover. But, uh, but 
unfortunately she resisted. So, uh, not, not, a, she's not, a, um, a, a, a Christian and, uh, but we keep praying for her and she's, uh, she's, she's, um, uh, still her memory loss is still in decline though. Vertigo, fatigue, and more. So a lot, a lot of things that mold, mold exposure can, can do. And, and, and it can get so bad where, where, um, you know, moving out is what we, we did. And we were fortunately able to move back into our house, but, but sometimes, uh, you, you just have to abandon everything and, and, uh, and, and never come back because, uh, in the Bible, if you read in, um, and the, the books of uh, the first five books of the of the Bible, you'll see in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, the the um, the, the laws concerning mold and uh, and it could get uh, and and they call it a plague or a leprosy of the house. And and even the stones, if, if it's bad enough, will have to be taken out and thrown, thrown, thrown out and use new stones to rebuild the house because there's just no um, no, no way of, re of remediating them. And so this is a link here for um, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Wes Youngberg, which we, uh, we consulted with uh, and, uh, and determined through some testing and uh, that um, I, I wanted to share with someone, someone asked about, uh, about links. And so I'm gonna put all the links here at one time in our, in our chats just to get this over with. And, uh, but anyway, we consulted with him on the, um, uh, on the phone. And, uh, and he was very helpful for, for us to understand um, what was going on with, with my wife. And so those are some, some links that are important links that I'm going to go over here right now. And, um, and so I recommend first thing when you, go, when you get a house, even your house right now, is get something like this, which is a humidity meter. You want to keep your, your humidity in your house. Uh, at 50% or between 40 and 50% is, is good. You get it too dry, what happens is your hardwood floors, if you have them dry out, the glue in your furniture dries out. But this is um, very important to keep track of, of your humidity in your house because what happened with us is, is um, not only do we have the, uh, the, the leakage underneath our dishwasher, and I'm gonna show you a picture of that, what, what, what happened. Um, what, what, that was drying the mold and uh, and blowing the uh, the spores throughout the house because there was there was a heating vent right underneath our cabinet where the where the black mold was, and it and it blew instead of using a duct work to get come out to the front of the cabinet it, they actually just blew across the floor and put like a little uh, vent on the front of the cabinet so it was it was very poorly designed, and um, and so anyway um, one of the first things you can do. Uh, uh, when you uh, is get a humidity meter and see what the humidity is in the house. Uh, we keep ours at, at 50%, but, but when we moved into our house, sometimes the humidity would get so bad in the house because we cook a lot and, and that, that water was running down the windows uh, inside the house. And that, and that, that is uh, prime breeding ground for, uh, for mold. And so this is, a, I just took this picture this evening. This is a, shows you minimum and maximum humidity. It shows you, and you can get these from, uh, from Amazon. I just sent that link uh, to everybody. And they're only like $19 and it's well worth having. And my wife now, we're, we're back in the house. Uh, honey, the, uh, the humidity is uh, 54%. Do you, do you know why? <laughs> or, uh, and then, uh, well, we have a, a, whole, a whole house uh, dehumidifier now to keep it, keep it low. And we're gonna talk more about that in, in, the, re, um, in the next talk on the re- um, uh, um, remediation section. And so um, what we did was when we, uh, we uh, started uh, understanding my wife was sick with, with mold, we started uh, following uh, this man here who has a company called Aero Biological um, uh, Solution, Solutions. And uh, he's in Washington, D.C., and we um, were uh, very impressed with his work. Now, and he's not the only one, you know, uh, let me just back up again and say that, that this, uh, uh, with, with mold, it's, uh, it's, it's highly controversial and even contentious on, on testing methods, on remediation methods, on, um, uh, on these, different, these different methods. And so, um, and Greg Weatherman is, uh, is a man here who actually uh, has, has uh, talked, uh, who actually testified at different people where they got sick for mold, workplace mold issues. Um, and so 
uh, my wife had been doing some uh, some some work, and he also worked very uh, closely with this man, uh, Doctor Shoemaker, who uh, survivingmold.com. I don't have that link, but it's survivingmold.com, which he uses more of a, a medical uh, treatment. But Doctor uh, West Youngberg actually refers to his, some of his work and is able to to apply some of his things that he does in a more natural, uh, more, with a more natural treatment to come over, uh, get over mold uh, toxicity. And so um, uh, we were able to bring in, uh, uh, we actually flew in Greg Weatherman to inspect not only our house, but also my mother's house. Uh, and, 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 and trying to convince my mother that you have a serious problem and got to get out of that house. And, uh, and unfortunately what happened when my mom, cause, cause, because mold can, can induce Alzheimer's. Many old people are in a, in mold, the moldy, uh, let, me, let me also say too that whenever you have a house that you walk into and, and it smells uh, smells stuffy, musty, uh, or th those are just other. Uh, that's that's mold. Uh, so it, it, you say, well, it's just a little musty smell that has to be addressed. You, your house should smell fresh and clean, and it, and it shouldn't it shouldn't have that that moldy musty smell. And my mother's house is a brand new house too, brand new, but she. Um, uh, got sick from the, uh, from the mold that was growing in her basement. And, and the, the whole house was just, um, got, got, became, we were able to, re, we actually, had, uh, for her house, we used a commercial um, remediation. We had to sell her house when she went into the nursing home. And so uh, we, we actually hired a commercial uh, remediation service uh, that was able to get her house uh, tested and uh, up to where, the, where, where it was, we were able to finally be able to sell it. Um, and, and uh, anyway, so um, we brought Greg Weatherman and we flew him in to test our house. And uh, I checked out receipts and this is going back, you know, a three or th uh, what was it? Four, three, 2018, I believe. And uh, it was about 1600 for each house. I think it was, which uh, it, it, there may be better ways uh, to, of doing it, uh, someone more local, but we decided to bring him in. And um, uh, Greg Greg Weatherman and and, uh, and he suggested before we flew him in, he suggested uh, uh, that and also Dr. West Youngberg suggested we get uh, what's called an ERMI test. Uh, this is um, uh, supposed to be the gold standard for, for environmental testing. Although there's some out there who say that it could give uh, false uh, false positives for uh, for excessive mold in the house, but but you'll hear about the uh, the ERMI test. E R M I and the hurts me test. <laughs> um, the hurts me test actually hurts less because it's less expensive. So the the ERMI test is um, an environmental uh, relative moldy index developed by the U.S. Department of uh, the EPA, and what it does is it uh, it checks for uh, for mold levels of thirty six different types of molds in, in your in your house and uh, and gives it, uh, an index number and compares them to a database of, of all homes across the United States. So they compare and they see if, if your house is, is uh, less moldy or more moldy than the average house in the United States. And then, um, uh, so it's recommended you get the ERMI test uh, uh, first and, the, um, and then later, so it's a subsequent test, you can get the Hertzme test, which is a subset, five, it just says five molds, which are known as the big five. Uh, Aspergillus, those are big names, and like uh, the Stachybotrys and uh, the uh, Willemia mold, and I've learned these names now, um, and, and it gives you a composite number for that. And so if you're over a certain uh, index, it means you're, it's probably uh, for someone who's got SIRS, they call it, which is um, a chronic inflammatory response is what you get when you, when you, uh, um, when you get, uh, problems with mold, inhaling, inhaling mold into your system. And so what the, what the, what these tests, what this test is, the ERMI test and the Hersme test is, uh, is, a uh, what they do is they send you a wipe and that you, you wipe, uh, dust, um, from your, uh, from different surfaces. And then you send in the, uh, in, in a little, um, uh, Ziploc bag. And then they, uh, they test the, uh, the, the mold in your house. And this is what the cost is. It's about, it's not cheap. 285 and um and now um and then say say for instance you want to do upstairs and downstairs you know that's uh that's you know 285 for each one of those tests and then what happens is that uh you're not really sure which room it came out of 
you know, what, where the mold is. It's kind of just a, a general, uh, you could just use one wipe for the whole house upstairs and downstairs and say, well, there's mold somewhere. You know, somewhere we test the mold. And the Hearst meat is $150 for the five mold species. And there's some other tests out there too. This isn't the only, only test you could, you could hire a professional that does, that does everything. And probably um, if I was to do it again, I, I might just hire a professional to do the, to the testing because the first time we did the Ermy test, we, um, we, we, we measured, uh, uh, I'll show you the results here. Um, there is it, right? Oh, this is what it is. It's basically, you're just wiping with the, they send a Swiffer cloth and, they, and you, you wipe down the surfaces and send in the cloth. And so this is our, what our report looked like. This shows all the different molds and, and the relative, and then they, they form an index is way at the bottom of the screen. And so it was uh, 12.76. And, uh, um, and this is the, uh, the chart that they send you uh, with, with it. And it's called the relative moldiness index value. And so zero means uh, is, is the average of all houses in, 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 see on the left-hand side, percent of homes in the US, 50%. Of the of the homes are less moldy or or, or more moldy than the this, this index of zero, and uh, um, and so that that was twelve point seven. So we 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 landed right here, which we were house was more moldy than most houses in the United States. And and what I was trying to say is that um, this is an expensive test, and and you can uh, uh, it, you 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 may get a reading. That uh, that's positive. That um, and, and you don't know what what room what, or rooms that the moldiness is is from. And then what happened was is that I did this. We started emptying the house uh, with, with from everything, and we tested again after we we cleaned the whole house. And actually, the index went up, and it was caught. It was caused by stirring up the uh, the dust in the house and the mold. And um, and so if I had to do it over again. I might. It's hard to say if I would have done it. I probably, uh, if I would have called a professional, maybe for testing, I, I would just to come and bring a professional tester because there's other ways of testing too. Another way is uh, for, for air sampling where they, they, they sample the air. And uh, actually Greg Weatherman's against that. Uh, but other people say it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a good way or excellent way of, of, of testing for mold. Another way is Petri dishes where they put that. That's an inexpensive way. Put Petri dishes in different places of the house. And I've never tried that. But that sounds very logical because it, it's from, from mold precipitating in the air. And you could put a, a Petri dish in different uh, rooms and, uh, and get an idea of, of the moldiness in your, in your house. But um, there are uh, uh, other ways besides testing to, to know whether or not you're um, you have mold in your house, and and some of the things are just uh, uh, like like Brother Don mentioned before, which was a very good uh, uh, advice is 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 hire a home inspector and uh, and have him um, and tell them that you want you're very concerned with mold and find every place where there's possibility uh, to have to have mold. In, in your house. And, and so if the house smells musty or, or mildewy, or, and especially if you see mold, you know, the house has got mold and it's got to be, got to be addressed. And so this is a report that he did um, uh, photos on his visual inspection of it was July 4th, 2018 uh, of our house and some of the comments that he had. And some of these things are very interesting. Some are, some are pretty obvious, you know, like for instance, you're going to see some mold on a, on a, um, uh, spots of mold on a bathroom um, on a bathroom ceiling, and uh, that's no good. You know, before we saw a little bit, you know, you clean it with a little bleach, and you you think, oh, you're done with it, you know. But but these things have to be addressed and prevented. So this is some of the pictures he took. He said um, he said here, clean below the refrigerator. This is one of the most important things about mold is is that you cleanliness is very important. And uh, he recommends a percentage of uh, uh, three parts of water to one part vodka, which I think is excellent for, for cleaning. Uh, it doesn't leave an odor because people, some people use vinegar, which is okay, but acetic acid is, uh, is very toxic, uh, especially if you breathe it. And if you look at the, uh, what, what acetic acid is, a vinegar is 5% uh, acetic acid. And, um, and uh uh, if you look at the material safety data sheet from the government for acetic acid, breathing the vapors is highly caustic to your to your uh, to your lungs, 
and uh, naturally it calls for hospitalization. You know, if, 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 if fortunately it's diluted five percent, so it's not uh, as regular vinegar is, but it's um, but it is a, it is a toxin. And so, but the vinegar, I mean, the, uh, the the vodka and water solution works works much better, much fresher smell, clean smell evaporates quickly, and it's very highly effective for cleaning uh, for cleaning mold. And so uh, he said to clean below the refrigerator. Uh, the, uh, here on the right hand side, the laundry dryer had a um, had a, a, a vent which was leaking. He said this leaks le lint, humidity, and micro microbial fragments because um, uh, basically uh, you need. Let me let me back up here. Uh, three things that are for to make mold uh, dangerous, and that's uh, uh, moisture, and that comes from this. In this instance, comes from clothes, wet clothes, moisture. Um, drying. That's another thing. When the mold gets dry, it starts releasing, releasing micro uh, fragments and mycotoxins, which can, can spread. And then velocity, air velocity. <laughs> this has all three, all three um, uh, uh, um, ingredients for mold toxicity. And that again, that's uh, moisture, drying, and then the, uh, the air velocity. And so if any of this, if that's leaking in your house somehow, not perfectly sealed, this could be a, a very, a, a source of, of a moldy uh, micro mycotoxins, which is the, 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 the toxin that molds release in the air to your house. So make sure your vent is, uh, is sealed very tight and, uh, and is vent venting outside. And this is here what happened. This is what we noticed too, that you can't really see in the picture, but the floor was all wavy in front of the dishwasher. And uh, it says here, water damage has occurred under the dishwasher impacting, impacting the plank flooring. And this uh, caused to be a major issue. He told us to check this and we pulled the dishwasher out, black mold all underneath and in the, on the cabinet to the, on the left hand to the left of this, it way in the back on the floor is where the vent register was. And, and, it, and then what they did was they just, they just screwed a, a vent, um, a little um, a grill, a grill on the bottom of the, uh, of the cabinet in the bottom. And so it was blowing, blowing across, water was leaking from the dishwasher, causing it to be moist. The hot air from the, and the, and the, uh, from the, um, the heat was drying the mold and then blowing across it, which was constantly feeding us with mycotoxins all through the winter. And so it was very, very bad, very bad. And so these are uh, some pictures, some more pictures that happened. Uh, uh, another another dryer vent we had. He said it looks like it was leaking. Uh, looks like it wasn't even connected properly, or went out the. Oh, here's a mold on the ceiling. You know that this is an issue that that um, you know many people will, will have mold. They say, "Oh, get around to cleaning it." There's there's mold. You you got to get it cleaned up, and because uh, they dry and they they start releasing toxins in the air, and. Um, and so if you check in your humidity in your house and then they even have these, um, we actually, after we re re rehab the house, we installed uh, uh, a fan that comes on in our bathroom at, at a certain humidity. Cause, cause um, my wife was actually very bad about that. Not turning the fan. I told her it could cause problems. And she, she, she cause she didn't, she, she wanted to always be very warm. She's from, the, my wife is from Brazil from the tropics and, and I liked it very warm. And, and look at this. This here, the effects of high humidity in the basement, condensing on the HVAC supplement vent. See, you can see this rust on the vent actually was, was caused by, uh, it was actually uh, with the air conditioning running, it would drip humidity from the, the, that. That's bad news, bad news for, um, and so what happened was, is because there was so much uh, uh, humidity in the air in our house, it was very, we never kept track of the humidity and it was, it was very, very humid is that, the uh, flexible duct work got all contaminated with mold and actually had to be uh, completely torn out of the house. And uh, in order to be it basically got contaminated. Another, uh, uh, we'll, we'll cover more of that in the, in the uh, remediation um, section, uh, actually the, the, yeah, the rehab and remediation next, um, next uh, Sabbath uh, evening. And so um, another uh, trouble point is that, um, and then we, we, uh, we that we had was this HVAC installed the matter does not allow quick access to coils and condensate drain pan for maintenance and cleaning. So we had this all taken out and we replaced the whole air conditioning and heating system and the um, 
And, and what, he, what he's basically saying is that the coils in here inside that your air conditioning and heating systems where uh, the, um, which would cools the, uh, cools the uh, uh, air, um, the air conditioning and heating uh, man who, when they did, when they installed the, the air conditioning and heating said to us that, um, that this is a frequent place for, for mold. And, uh, and that would be horrible. You know, that's why it's important to have a good uh, filtration system uh, in your house. Uh, they, um, uh, there was a MERV value, M-E-R-V uh, value that he recommended as one of those thick filters. And I, um, I, I don't have the exact uh, MERV as is, is how, how well it, uh, but it's basically it's a, it's a filter which, which uh, will, will help uh, considerably. But, but anyway, so the new air conditioning heating system has an access that we can easily remove the, the plate and inspect to see if it's uh, any kind of moisture, if it needs any cleaning or anything. Next one here. Um, it's on the upper left, it says ground floor sink uh, had minor leakage and can be sanded and sealed with uh, diluted with glue. So see, there was actually some mold. This view is a view right here at the, at the bottom underneath that shows a little bit of mold from leakage. And because there's no velocity, air velocity uh, there, it, it, he's basically saying is that you can, um, you can take some uh, sanded and, and seal it with some diluted wood glue. But uh, we ended up getting rid of the vanity. My, my wife didn't want to take any chances. So, uh, but, but anyway, um, so we, uh, but, but if, if the, there is, uh, you could save some of the furniture, but we, and we decided not to. We, we didn't want to take any chances of, uh, I wanted, one, my wife wanted everything new in the house. Because another, another side effect of a mold, uh, mold toxicity is uh, panic attacks, law, law, not able to breathe. Um, it, it, it's horrible. Especially if you're sensitive, and as we discussed last week, there's people who have a a, a double copy of a mutation called MTHFR, which is um, which is a gene which which has to do with uh, 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 methylation, which is which which helps in the which which is the detoxification of your of your of your body. And some people are have um, that double. I have a double copy actually. My wife has a single copy. And about 28% of the population have it. And so it's not like everybody, just because you have mold in your house, is it, can, can, it's like some people can, uh, uh, can, can tolerate uh, cigarette smoke. Others is just horrible for it. Uh, but, but it's not good for you anyway. But, but some people you just taught, my wife was one who couldn't tolerate it. And, and, and the rest of the family was able to tolerate it much better. Um, he also did an inspection uh, of the windows. And uh, this is something I, I, that, that may be new to you. He said, uh, signs of leakage. He, he looked carefully in the, in the corners of the window and saw cracks where there was expansion. And, and what happened was he, he said to us, there are two types of windows. And um, he said, there's uh, windows that, uh, that leak and windows that are going to leak. And what he, what he basically is saying is on the outside of a window, there's um, there's your, your screen and, and, and sometimes, uh, many times rain or moisture can get into the corners and, uh, and because of the sunlight and, and the weather, they expand and contract and the corners, which are usually welded or sealed, can, can crack, even a microscopic crack and it can start leaking in the corner. And if your windows are not sealed properly, and we're gonna go over that next week, uh, how to make sure your windows are, are sealed, um, uh, all the way around where no moisture can, can get in and, and cause a uh, rot and, and mold on your, uh, on your, uh, your plywood in the corners of your windows. And I'm going to show you what, what happened was uh, on our addition that uh, we had put in that the builder did not properly seal the, around the windows. And now, now I'm noticing when I drive around, I, I see some new subdivisions go up, new, new housing developments. They're putting this rubber, this uh, asphalt butyl, uh, sealant all around the window to make sure that if windows do leak in the corners that they don't cause uh, um, uh, mildew or, 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 or cause mold on the plywood. And so, um, so here um, we, he also said uh, another picture of window leakage close up on the cracks in there. And then um, also something else, uh, and I'm going to show you a picture of what happened in a, in a moment. Also, he know we. My son was putting in hardwood floor, and he was using a special glue to glue the. Uh, that's supposed to be that's waterproof. He said he said the wood flooring was applied to the basement floor with an allegedly waterproof seal. And my son was, who's a hardwood flooring expert, was uh, uh, put off by that a little bit. But um, but it is it is special glue, 
And so it's possible if, if you don't have the right glue or hardwood floor glued down to a concrete that you could, you could uh, have a problem because moisture comes up from the ground underneath and it, and it could uh, cause, cause mold underneath your, uh, your hardwood floor. And so um, what we ended up doing, and I'll talk just a little bit in the remediation, uh, we had my son and I actually removed every window of the house and to check the, to check the corners to see if there's any leak, water leakage. And, um, and the, the, the windows in the, in the whole main house were okay, but it was what the most interesting thing was in the new addition, what happened was they already started to leak because they weren't installed with the proper uh, sealant around the, 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 the rubber butyl uh, flashing, they call it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a six inch wide piece of um, uh, uh, flashing or adhesive flashing, but it's not, I think of flashing usually with metal, but this is actually made of rubber and uh, uh, like asphalt. Anyway, we didn't have it around. He didn't install them around the windows. In fact, he said, the builders said, I never even heard of that before. But, but anyway, this is what, the, what it looked like. Horrible leakage in the corners of the, see the corners of the windows? That's just exactly, this is the, in the new addition too. And so we were, in the next uh, video, we'll show you how we, 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 uh, we took care of this, but this was a big surprise for us. We removed every single window in the house and the windows in the new addition had, had mold in the corners. And, and you say, well, it's on the outside of the house, but it, 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 it actually was able, was actually through the wall and um, and so we were able to uh, to reseal everything, remove this. We had to remove this plywood and re replace it. But and so uh, that concludes our talk about home inspection and uh, and testing. And uh, next week we're going to talk about uh, uh, home remediation, what we did in our house, and how we uh, we got our house to in a livable condition where we're back in it now. We were, we're back in it for a year now. And we just uh, love the house and. Uh, and um, and it's uh, we're we're all breathing a lot easier now. So back to you, Sharon. Wow, thank you so much, um, 